welcome to those that have just joined us. I think there might be a few people that will be joining us a bit late. I'm going to end the polling in a few seconds. So if you really have a burning desire to do it now, now's your chance and then I'll show you the results. My name is Haylette Bertrand. I'm from the Institute for Futures Research and I'll be the co-host for today's session. So I've just ended the, the polling. It'll be interesting just to have a look at the results. So it seems that most people are still fairly optimistic about the future of Africa. Um, and the focus on Africa seems to be quite varied. And the strategic focus concerning Africa is also mostly medium. So I'm sure we're going to have a great Great session today with Dr. Monet Mostert speaking around the scenarios for alternative African futures. And he's going to be looking specifically at the Goldilocksian framework. Um, and as you know, we do live in interesting times. So I'm finding these kind of sessions to be quite helpful in just making sense about what's going on in the world, because I don't think anybody knows the answers at this present time. So just before we start, I'm going to welcome Christelle to say a few words, but just to let you know, you are welcome to um, keep your video on. It's always quite nice to see someone and it helps Dr. Moster to feel like there are just, there are real people waiting and listening, not just um, names on a screen. So if you can, please do keep your mic on mute. It just gets a bit cumbersome if everybody's mics are not on mute. Um, we will be having a and a session towards the end if there are any burning questions. You'll see that if on your screen, you, there should be a menu option at the bottom of Zoom. There is a participant mm -hmm. option there. If you click on that, you'll see there's a raise hand function. What happens then is I have a list of who's in the room. I can then see your hand being raised and I can then point you, point you out and you can then actually ask your question personally. In the interim, you are also welcome to use the group chat function if you want to introduce yourself there or if you have any specific comments or questions you want to ask, I'll monitor that and see if there's anything there that we can raise. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Christelle, the manager for alumni relations at the University of Stellenbosch Business School. I'm sure you all know her. And she's just going to say a few words of welcome. Thank you, Christelle. Hi, thank you, Elit, and welcome everybody onto our alumni webinar this morning. Just a few words from me. We're very proud to host this in partnership with um, IFR um, and to welcome all alumni and corporate and student and guests onto the platform. Due to the current pandemic, most of our all our events, the networking and cocktail events and speaker events are now presented as alumni webinars. And we also have a masterclass coming up on the 29th of May with Dr. Dorian Aiken. So you're very welcome to register for that as well. But just a few words from me and to welcome and we look forward to your participation. Um, some benefits have been posted on the screen that you can see. Um, and then lastly, just I would like to also, if I can just move to the next slide, um, introduce our um, USB program agent for Mauritius, West and East Africa. Contact details are there. You're welcome to contact Dr. Mariki van Amarwe if you're interested in any of the USB programs. Um, they're based in Mauritius um, and this webinar was originally um, planned for Mauritius. So if any um, information required on USB programs, contact details is there. We will also share this post the event. Thank you, Yolette. Over to you. Thank you, Christelle. And you're welcome to always contact Christelle. I know she's always available if you have any questions around the Alumni Association and how it works. But um, let me introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Mostert, who's also my boss. Um, I'm happy to work with him at the Institute for Futures Research. Uh, for if you didn't know, the USB is currently the only university in Africa that has an Institute for Futures Research. So we study the future, which basically means that which has not happened. And the current times for us is very, very interesting. So we are very privileged to speak to you today. But just to let you know a little bit more about Dr. Mostert, he is the director for the Institute of Futures Research. 
He advises globally on future-based executive decision-making and cognitive development for senior leaders. He does this all over the world. He has his PhD in management of technology and innovation, and his areas of interest and specialization is futures thinking, strategic thinking, systems thinking, um, and creativity and innovation. He's a regular keynote speaker and a guest on radio and television. You might be seeing him in the in the media lately. I know that he's commented on many things around what, what is the future holding and what are the possibilities. He's also an author of a book called Systemic Leadership Learning, Leadership Development in the Era of Complexity, which I think we are very much into at the moment, complexity. And then he's also a member of the ILO International Panel of Experts on the Future of Work, and he's also a member of the Club of Rome. So welcome, Dr. Mostert. We look forward to hearing from you. Um, and uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Hailet. And uh, thank you for that, that lovely introduction. Um, it's, uh, it's good to be with you. Um, and I'm excited to spend a few moments with alumni. It is astonishing that almost 80 people uh, still have energy for Zoom at this very late stage of uh, developments. Um, you'll notice that um, I think I might be the only person uh, in the last four weeks uh, to have a title for a webinar that does not contain the word Corona or COVID. And I think that, uh, that, that, deserves, um, that deserves at least a, a little recognition. Thank you very much for joining us. I really would appreciate if you if you are willing to uh, switch on your your camera. I, I really that would help me enormously. I always love to see uh, sort of different styles of pajamas. It's um, I find it very encouraging. Um, so thank you very much. Hey, let will um, will uh, just close that slide and unshare in a moment, and then I'll I'll share um, I'll share some thoughts. Uh, with you. And as you've heard, um, Dr. Mariki Fanamava was the original um, co-host of this session. Um, and it's, it, 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 and therefore, uh, this conversation has a bit of an Africa flavor. And as you heard in the introduction of my profile, I'm essentially interested in thinking. Um, I do occasionally work, uh, but most of my time is spent on thinking. And so what you'll hear in the next a uh, few moments is just a, a framework, an attempt really um, to shape um, some of the way that we think about the future of Africa and then the extent also to which perhaps COVID has influenced this. Um, the Goldie Option framework, which I'll share, um, has appeared in presentations before and I'm curious to get your feedback on what it might mean in the current context. So with your permission, then I'll um, I'll just ask the host to enable my uh, sharing um, while, while that's happening. Some of you might be shocked to see me on the screen. Those of you who know me will know that when the lockdown started, I was in fact bald. Um, things have, um, have moved on rapidly since then. Um, I can tell we're dealing with a little bit of a serious audience, uh, but we'll, we'll see if we can overcome that as, uh, as things develop. Um, by the way, um, our very strong recommendation to clients currently is that it's already serious, you shouldn't take it seriously. And the reason for that is that uh, when you get serious, you try to get into silly things like back to basics, uh, which will definitely not help you. Um, in the future of your business or indeed of, of Africa. So um, please feel free to comment on the chats. Um, we will have an opportunity for some feedback as we go along. Share your views. Our experience uh, is that uh, alumni um, never have a shortage of opinions. That's not something that we suffer from. And so please uh, do feel free to, to share those views as we go along as I address you here from the comfort of my bar, those of you who are uh, uh, recognizing the background. And that's because uh, just like many of you, my son is attending school online and my wife is in another Zoom meeting um, next door. Um, okay, so uh, when we try to make sense of Africa, 
the, the, the one thing that we can say is that it is, it's just so complex. It's almost, it's, it's complex to almost a crazy degree. Anything you can say about the, co the continent, you can say the opposite and it's also true. There's poverty, but there's extraordinary wealth. There's a, there's a limit to access to opportunity and yet, you know, the, all these resources and there's war and there's peace and there's, um, there's, there's harmony and there's violence, you know, wherever you look and there's positive, there's optimism and there's a large negative uh, aspects also. We saw from the poll, for example, this morning, that question one about how optimistic are you? Um, that's a very low score. Um, and so what we really just try to do um, as co-thinkers with clients, and by the way, those of you new to the IFR uh, should know that most of our work is in fact with clients, typically large organizations, typically senior people, thinking about what's possible, what's plausible and what's probable. Um, I feel I always have to say that because some people still think universities are places where uh, we teach 18, 19 year olds um, some of the fundamentals. Whereas an institute like ourselves, as you heard, the, the only one on the African continent is essentially concerned with advisory services for organizations. Um, I'm always encouraged by, um, by what Pliny the Elder, uh, remembering my Latin education, um, who borrowed it from Aristotle, um, uh, said about Africa, the idea that uh, there's always something new out of Africa, always something new. And one of the fascinating questions to me is what will be new in the future of Africa, especially given the current situation? If there's always something new, and that's always been the case, it was originally mentioned just because of the amazing array of, of wildlife, uh, which used to be transported back to Europe. Um, it's increasingly become um, a, a technology novelty. Uh, but also a social innovation hub. And so we're curious about what lies in the future of Africa. We have a, a kind of rule of thumb at the IFR just to uh, position our thinking uh, that we refer to as 203050, which means that uh, our general recommendation is that senior people should spend about 20% of their intellectual energy on the past, about 30% on the future, uh, on the current, the present, and about at least 50% on the future. Now, I'm going to talk just very briefly on the past and talk then about a framework that might help us to decode the future. But what I'd like you to do is to think about at a time like this, how much of your intellectual energy is spent on the past, the present, or the future? The difficulty with a crisis is that it accentuates that 30%. It makes it 80 or 90 percent. And the risk of that is, of course, that um, we forget that we've had the new normal before. Um, you know, before this, the, the rise of the alt right was the new normal, and then Brexit was the new normal, and before that, Trump was the new normal, and before that, um, it, you know, Islamic terrorism was the new normal, and then the, the dot-com crash was the new normal, and then the dot-com boom was the new normal, and, you know, then the fall of the Soviet Union was the new normal. And so, in a way, it, it's really important to think in what we call a multifactorial way. In other words, to try, as difficult as it is, to consider more than one factor at the same time. The mind finds it actually extremely difficult in terms of thinking processes to think about more than one thing. But just an invitation again, as you sit there reflecting in your pajamas, how much of your time are you spending thinking in a multifactorial way? Um, in my humble view, um, the National um, Commission on COVID is not thinking in a multifactorial view. They seem to be thinking in a very one dimensional view and uh, that view is, is unfortunately typical of a pattern that's become outdated, which is the need for something to fight. The light in their, their eyes that they now have sight to fight poverty, they like to fight unemployment, combat HIV and so on. And the, the, need, the need for a fight um, is a great temptation to work with single factors, one dimension.
And, um, and having a kind of broad multidimensional mind is really what we're after as futurists. And, um, and here's just an example of such a broad mind. This is Penti Malaska in 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell. This man from the, the Finland Futures Research Institute um, imagined this, Africa beyond famine, a future of Africa that's not governed, in other words, by typical traditional patterns. Um, an example of a futurist who, who, even from outside of Africa, from Finland, could imagine an alternative for the continent. And it turns out uh, Malaska is in good company. Um, Einstein also uh, argued that the true sign of intelligence uh, is not knowledge, but imagination. Now, if Einstein is correct, and you have to say uh, he's got a lot going for him uh, in terms of the probability of being correct, then this has serious implications for the way that we think, for example, about the, f the future of higher education, the future of universities. Um, I can't remember ever having attended a, a, a double session on a Thursday afternoon on imagination. And so really what I'm inviting you to think about is, is, is how imagination can help us to conceive alternative futures um, for our own businesses in the continent. Einstein goes on to say, uh, for example, that your imagination is your preview of life's coming attraction. Now, why is that relevant particularly today? Why is the cognitive processing of imagination featuring strongly in what I'm sharing with you? What a crisis does to the mind is essentially a lockdown. Yes, I, you may have heard that word before. So what a crisis does is a mental lockdown. And what that means is that you revert to the known. So just as a physical lockdown makes you go back to your home, spending, times with the, spending time with the people that uh, before the lockdown you thought were your loved ones. Um, I hope you are still happily married. Um, the, the dilemma of a mental lockdown is it's not very imaginative. It unfortunately uh, reverts to the known. And there are other psychological reasons for why we revert to the known. Of course, the chief among them is the need for certainty. And certainty is, um, is facilitated mainly by things that you can feel and see and touch. We call it positivism. Not the idea of being positive, but the idea of physical things, tangible things. And so my encouragement to you is to remind yourself in a session like this that your imagination is still there. The other implication of a crisis is that when the imagination does come alive, it tends to imagine the worst. We um, produced a set of scenarios for, uh, for COVID uh, right at the onset, and it was published in a book uh, already two weeks ago now. So it was one of the fastest published uh, books uh, by multiple authors in South African history, I think. Um, and even there, we were arguing that um, that the, the, uh, the analysis for the future of um, COVID in Africa and in, in South Africa, certainly, would require an alternative imaginative approach rather than a single factor approach, which we're now seeing, unfortunately, from government. So when we think about general strategy and the general strategy advisory work uh, I do with clients, as you heard, in all sorts of places all around the world, um, um, including in, in at least 12 other African countries, but, but also a lot in Western Europe, a key strategy question we always pose is if you assume the world is unfair, which I think is a reasonable thing to assume, how is the world asymmetrically structured in favor of Africa? How is it asymmetrically structured in our favor? In other words, how is it unfair in our favor? We know that we've had a horrid history, and I'll refer to that very briefly. But what has Africa got? What have we got that the rest of the world may want? Um, that's a really important kind of stimulus for imagination. So imagine a place, if you will, um, just to remind you of where we live, where markets are largely underexplored, where we have the fastest urbanization on the planet, where literacy rates and democracy are rising faster than anywhere else in the world, where online banking, for example, in the financial services sector is already well developed, where the demographic dividend, that is the ratio of people of employable age to people of non-employable age, is ripe for the picking and should survive for the next 20 to 30 years, 
where the greatest internet boom is yet to happen, where vast quantities of the world's natural resources are held, which you all know, uh, where democracy is not only flourishing, but is being reinvented, a place where you can find ancient wisdom, as well as modern youthful perspectives, where your money can still make a difference and where your industry will almost undoubtedly reinvent yourself, reinvent itself. If I told you about a place like that, in a crisis like this, you might say, tell me a little more about this place. Well, um, I'll just very brief, briefly remind you of this place. We've had museums and libraries 300 years before the birth of Christ where Aristoteles, for example, measured the Earth's circumference to an accuracy within a few hundred miles. We've had the Gia Scrolls about 500 years later, evidence of a very well-developed high level of literacy, especially in Aksum, which was the, the, which is like the, it was in Ethiopia, Eritrea, but it's like the modern day Manhattan, a place of enormous diversity, including nationality, but also religious diversity, linguistic diversity. Africa was the place of Augustine of Hippo. That was the pose of a selfie in his day, around 400 AD. Um, modern models use the, the duck ball mouth. In those days, you looked far into the distance, raised your hand and pretended you were inspired by God. But he wrote about two things that is on CNN almost every day, at least before Corona, and that is, do we have free will, which I think is really interesting for Corona. The way the South African government is behaving at the moment, it seems free will um, is a thing of the past. And he wrote about just war theory. What is a just war? What is a reasonable war? What is an acceptable war, like the war in Syria or Iraq? Um, this is a man of Africa. You're familiar, perhaps, with the kingdom of Makungubwe, the modern day Zimbabwe. Well, Need I say more about how that's collapsed? Africa is the home um, of the first university in the world. Um, I was there about two years ago. This is uh, Al Karawin in Tunisia. Um, the, um, the second university in the world, uh, also Al Azhar University in Cairo. Um, you're familiar perhaps with the astonishing intellectual work done at Timbuktu uh, in the 12th century in Mali. It would take another thousand years before we had another university, by the way. And then 30 years after that, the Berlin Conference, which chopped up Africa as if it is its own little pizza. And that would cause harm uh, for the next uh, century and more. In an attempt to bring it all back together again, like Humpty Dumpty couldn't do, the AU tries to bring back all these chopped bits in an attempt for integration. And the recent African Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, trying to take that further. So with just that very brief bit of background, perhaps 20% of my session here, um, we know that in South Africa, for example, we are in what is widely considered to be the world's most unequal country. And so when we think about the future of South Africa and the future of Africa at large, um, that's something that shouldn't be forgotten. And the coronavirus, for example, is having very significant implications um, for this reality that we currently face. And in my view, makes the current lockdown um, approach an absolute insanity. Um, all sorts of facts have become um, evident as, um, as we've learned more about Africa. This, for example, was from The Economist just to illustrate some of the scale of Africa. Um, our former president, Jacob Zuma, looked at the map and commented on uh, in the media that uh, he's found out that the whole of the world can fit into Africa, um, to which even my 12-year-old son said, well, where would Africa go then? But the point is that um, um, it's, a, it's a vast continent, about 30 million square kilometers. There's also a lot of ignorance about Africa, not surprisingly from the orange man across the pond. Um, here's an example where he praises a country for the health uh, system in a country called Nambia. Um, and I, I love the fact that as Africans, we, we don't hesitate because what then happened is someone from Nambia uh, produced a map um, of the continent uh, based on how the orange man himself might conceive of our beloved continent. And um, 
you know, I think this has serious implications for, uh, for the future of our continent because the ignorance uh, just seems to be uh, so significant and, and so vast. But let me get to the main focus of um, my thesis this morning, colleagues, um, with a model that um, I've dubbed the Goldilockian framework. The Goldilockian framework. And uh, some of you, I'm sure, are well ahead of me for why I've called it exactly this. With that kind of history that I've just uh, briefly shared, I thought it might be wise to find a way of connecting Europe, particularly our erstwhile colonial masters, the British, who are also um, one line of my own forefathers. Um, and uh, what struck me there is, um, is I, I chose as a sort of icon, which is something we often do in scenarios. Uh, you choose a sort of iconic idea that is illustrative. Um, and I, I chose here um, the most obvious British girl I could think of, uh, which is Goldilocks. It's, um, it's a gripping tale. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the, the story originally conceived of by Robert Sully in 1937. Um, a little bit of a, a crazy tale. Um, a young British girl finds herself lost in the forest. Well, already that is enormously metaphorical, is it not? Um, citizen of the British Empire. Uh, this story, by the way, just to date it, uh, came out just a few years before, of course, the British settlers, um, some of your and my forefathers, landed here in Port Elizabeth uh, in 1820. So, a fascinating tale of a young British girl. By the way, the original tale was an old woman, but that's not... Um, uh, that doesn't fly, as we can see from modern media, so eventually it was changed to a young girl. And she finds herself lost in the forest. The forest is always a metaphor, and metaphor is really important when trying to understand the future. Um, this is evident from futurists like uh, Sohail Inyatullah. Metaphor of the young British girl, a uh, member of the British Empire, finds herself lost in the forest. In other words, um, a, li a little bit lost, not quite sure what to do, but partially because she ventured into an area that she was unfamiliar with, very much as the British ventured into Africa. And uh, you know the rest of the story, it's really quite bizarre. Um, it's a tale in which the humans are lost and the bears have learned to build houses. Really kind of quite strange. I'm not sure whether we often consider the realities uh, of the story. Um, and um, the girl is lost and finds, uh, finds a house in the woods. Just before that, cut back to the previous scene, uh, the three bears decide to go for a walk. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of an odd detail in the story. Um, I mean, I thought that's what bears just do all the time. They, they go for walks, but um, um, I don't think they ever have it on the agenda. But this bear family, uh, Mama Bear, Papa Bear, and Baba Bear, uh, they decide they're going to go for a walk. And then there is a home invasion. There's a home invasion by a citizen of the British Empire. She enters the house, uh, entitled, as colonialists often are, and proceeds to test the house uh, for her own liking. And, um, you know, has the experience that the porridge, for example, is either too hot or too cold, and then just finds it just right has the same experience with the chair, which she then in a very violent way breaks and, um, and then goes for a nap, uh, fearless that uh, anything bad might happen. Of course, when suddenly uh, the bears who have clearly learned to make furniture uh, and prepare hot food, perhaps a very futuristic tale, um, they arrive back on the scene. Uh, she leaves never to be seen again. I thought this was really interesting, the parallels between uh, what the British Empire did in colonization uh, in Africa and what Goldilocks did. So with Goldilocks then um, as uh, a central contributor to the nomenclature of my model, um, some of you perhaps have cottoned on to the idea that the second part of the model known as Goldilocksian is referred to uh, not in honor of Alexander Lockshin, who was a Russian composer uh, accused of treason by Stalin, um, but uh, is in fact named after 
a popular African slang word uh, for a place that looks like this, the Lokshin, the uh, a contraction of the word location. And so the, the, the uh, proposed framework uh, colleagues is named after these two um, crazy realities, the, the Western world of Goldilocks and the African world, uh, unfortunately, tragically characterized by the Lokshin, the Goldilocksian framework. Um, yeah, not sure if, if Goldilocks um, makes any sense here. Strange that she would be more comfortable in the forest than here, but nevertheless. Okay, so in then trying to, to shape thinking, trying to create some sort of thought process, um, the, the, the kind of dilemma is to find a, a, a reasonable, acceptable balance um, in the level of complexity. And typically, um, most of us have a binary view. We either feel that it's extremely simple, there's only one thing to do. I'm sure some of you have heard that in your Skype and Zoom and Teams sessions over the last few weeks. There'll always be someone who says, this is basically about one thing. Um, there's almost nothing that I can think of that is about one thing. In fact, I'm currently offering a reward of $10,000 for someone who can think of anything that was caused by only one thing. I haven't been able to find something, but I'm, I'm happy to pay for my education as you already have as alumni of USB and the bargain it was to given your current wealth. So the, um, the conundrum um, in thinking frameworks is always to find a tolerable level of multifactorality, because just as it is insane to argue that the virus or Africa's future or anything else is single is a single factor problem, it is equally useless to be the sort of consultant that says, "Well, things are so overwhelmingly complex, there's nothing you can say." That's a that's also sort of the popular popular diet of pop futurists. They'll tell you typically that things are just so overwhelmingly complex, there's nothing you can say. I think that is an equal pseudo intellectual cop out as much as it is to pretend that there's only one thing that will drive the future of any other thing, South Africa, Africa, or whatever it is. And that one thing typically tends to be the noise of the day whether it's Trump or the alt-right or Islamic terrorism or the dot-com crash or Brexit or whatever it is, um, the single factor is very tempting. It's extremely tempting to say this thing that we have now, this is the thing that will cause everything and change everything. Um, it may very well have a very big impact, but the, the, the intellectual challenge is to get towards a tolerable point of multifactorality, to, to have just enough um, what we call requisite thought architecture, just enough scaffolding in your intellectual makeup to start to put together some of the possible futures. And those of you who have seen our, our scenario work on, um, on the, in the, attempt then, and this is a very difficult attempt, of course, to move towards a tolerable level of multifactorality. Um, the Goldilocksian framework then starts, as many frameworks must, with an exploration of the base. Now, that in, in, in future studies and scenario work, in almost all approaches to scenario work, there is the uh, phenomenon of the so-called base case. And that has a few meanings. The, the first meaning is the status quo. That's just what's going on right now. What is happening? Where are we uh, in terms of that base? And so it's, it's uh, when we think about the future of Africa, a kind of crazy question, 54 countries, all of them so very different, perhaps even impossible to answer. One of the things I think we have to ask is what is the, what is the base? What is there right now? What is the base? In scenarios where you think about how that base evolves into the future, 
you often work towards describing the base case, um, which is sometimes in scenario work referred to as the current future. So if things continue the way they are continuing right now, what does that future look like? And in describing the base case, it's really important to understand that the, the base is not the same as the base case, if you'll forgive the, uh, the assonance. Um, the base is just the current structure and infrastructure. The base case is the evolution of that current infrastructure. So whether that infrastructure is mental, intellectual, or physical in terms of roads um, and bridges, um, that, that doesn't really matter. There is a status quo, that's what things are like at the moment, and there is the base case, that is, where is it moving? So, hey, let, perhaps I could ask uh, those who have uh, honored us with their presence to just give us the name of a country in Africa, excluding South Africa, which has in their view, a large, strong base. And these are some of the examples that you may think about in your response. So please, no essays or uh, theses in the comments section, the chat section, please, just the name of a country, a country that you think has a well-developed infrastructure that's geographically accessible, that has a high level of mobile penetration, that has favorability of the legislative environment with high literacy levels are already present, where there is socio-political stability, policy certainty, a high level of consumer confidence, business confidence, and access to essential resources. Helet, if I could invite our participants in the chat section to give us just the name of a country that they think um, reflects probably not all of these. I'm not sure if there is one country that has all of these, but a country that has perhaps a, a, a preponderance of these in their, uh, in their view. We'll just give it a few moments for people yes, to reflect. Yes, no. so there's a, there's a few that have come through and they're quite varied. So we've got Tanzania, we've got Nigeria, we've got Rwanda, Morocco, Kenya, Mauritius, Ethiopia, Tunisia, Botswana, Namibia, Rwanda, Mauritius, possibly Rwanda, Kenya, Ghana, Egypt, Botswana, Rwanda seems to come up quite a bit, Kenya, Egypt a few times, Ghana, Mauritius I've seen a few times, but quite varied. Rwanda seems to be the one popping up the most. Um, there's been a few Botswanas, so as complex as Africa can be. <laughs> yes, yes. So that's, in a sense, that's, that's really wonderful um, that people are able to identify um, such countries. And it, it does make me wonder sometimes why then the Afro-pessimism? If, if so many of us are able to say, well, you know, uh, Botswana, Rwanda, Kenya, Mauritius, Ethiopia, uh, Tanzania, um, a number of others, um, already have a very strong base. It's a, it's a curious question to me why on our poll, for example, the, the confidence levels were just so low. And I, um, I do a, a lot of work um, on how our paradigms of Africa, I'm sorry for the use of the word paradigm colleagues, it's, it's unfortunately a legal requirement for a futurist to use the word paradigm at least 26 times a day. Uh, you can be disbarred as a futurist if you don't say paradigm at least 20 times in a presentation. Um, but I, I'm, I'm often curious about how that paradigm of Africa was developed um, by Goldilocks and others um, and how much of that kind of still lingers. Um, if we accept there's a very strong base, um, why are we so nervous of the base case? Um, and perhaps I can I can just invite you to uh, to think about it. So so just to take a step back, uh, colleagues, and just reflect on the method here, the process here. There are many ways uh, to develop thinking frameworks. This is just a very simple version. 
and uh, not a bad idea to start with the base case uh, kind of, and, 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 and that would be based on the base if you'll forgive the repetition. Um, what is that base? And, um, and so for investors, for example, what do they typically look at? And for your own African expansion, um, um, and on, on this note, uh, I mean, we, we've had it in the poll, but um, what I'd uh, like to ask Caleb is if I could invite the participants, those of you who uh, either have an Africa strategy already and or are involved somehow in discussions, um, even as an advisor consultants with companies who are thinking about it. Could we have your view on the, the base for the Africa strategy? And all I want you to write in the uh, chat section is simply uh, zero, freeze, normal, or accelerate? Let me repeat the question. What I would like the uh, participants to reflect on is that in their engagements, when people think about the, the Africa strategy, either for your own work or your, your own business or a business that you're employed in or a business that you advise, given the fact that we're now in COVID, the conversations around the Africa strategy, have they gone to zero? Have they frozen? Maybe that's a similar thing. Have they stayed the same or have they accelerated? Let's see if there are any responses, Haylet, from the participants. I think a good question, Monet. <clears throat> so again, varied, a uh, few frozen. Some has indicated accelerate. Ah. Um, yeah, varied, accelerate, frozen, accelerate, frozen, <laughs> accelerate. A varied picture. Yes, quite varied. Although accelerate seems to have gone up. That's very interesting, isn't it? Very encouraging, if, if, if I may say. That's enormously encouraging. And, and perhaps, if, if I may ask those who have uh, responded with accelerate, um, I, I would like to extend an invitation to you towards the end of the presentation, just to, if you want, of course, to give us a view on, um, on why you think accelerate is the, uh, the accelerate button has been pushed. Very, very interesting. So, so we can see that there is, there's a multitude of perspectives in complexity. We always work with multiple partial views and very encouraging that uh, there are in fact a, a number of organizations and individuals who press the accelerate button when it comes to the Africa strategy. Okay, so in the Goldilocks framework then when you're thinking of your Africa strategy and you're thinking geographically, you're trying to identify a geographical region. And by the way, of course, this model is not limited to Africa. I've used it in the Middle East, for example, where I've done a lot of work in Jordan and Dubai and Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi and so on. Um, to think about geographical uh, expansion and the base um, and the criteria may vary, um, but it's not a bad first step then to think about exactly what is uh, that base. And we saw some of that work in the South African response to COVID, for example, where we, for the first time, had to have a look at how many, um, how many quarantine beds do we have in the health system? In other words, what's the base? Okay. Okay, so that then the base and um, you, you can apply this thinking. It's a very, very simple um, idea. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to get to simple ideas because there's so much noise, but you can see that you can apply that in various respects in terms of your own family or your own finances or a whole host of other things. That then is the base. Now I've warned you against the risk of a single factor approach. And so, while there uh, is always someone who will argue that it is all about the base, I'm so sorry, I, I prepared for this last night and I got a little bit carried away um, with your permission. But then again, it is perhaps a little bit um, too serious. 
Um, it, it is, in fact, uh, not all about the base. I can sense now that I've, um, I've gone too far and embarrassed myself. Um, but um, we want to move, remember, to, um, to a multifactorial approach. Um, we want to introduce more dimensions, in other words. And so um, it turns out it, it's not all about the base, um, despite the views of Megan Trainor. Um, it uh, is also about the pace. In other words, in other words, how quickly is this changing positively relative to its peers? How quickly is it changing positively relative to its peers? In other words, the base as a, as a factor um, no matter how important, uh, is necessary but not a sufficient criteria uh, for evaluating uh, geographical targets. Um, and so um, what you can see from, from this very simple diagram is that there will be countries in all four of those dimensions, right? Those uh, with a high base that is simply not moving if you go to the, the top left quadrant there high base not really moving. Um, those with a low base not really moving in the bottom left. Those in the bottom right that are moving quite quickly but are doing so in that phrase that describes so many African countries um, in the words of economists and that is coming off a low base. And then of course there are those in the top right hand corner there um, that, um, that have a high base and are moving at a rapid pace. So I'm going to ask Haylet if we could get some feedback again from those um, from those uh, who haven't. In fact, if you haven't commented, please join us um, on their views on the countries that are um, moving apace. In other words, they're they're advancing at a rapid rate. Could we have some examples from our participants just in the chat room? Give us some examples of a country that you think is moving at an advanced pace. And just as we give people uh, an opportunity to express their views, and we're, we're very curious about that, um, I'm very interested in the, the knowledge differential here. In other words, is it true that we have more knowledge of the base than we have of the pace? And you can see for futurists, where we want to spend about 20% of our intellectual energy on the past, 30% on the present, that is the base, and at least 50% on the future, that is the pace, or at least driven by the pace. It's a, it's a curious question to me whether knowledge of the base in fact exceeds knowledge of the pace. So, Haylet, have we had a few responses? Yeah, we've had quite a few. So, um, initially it seemed Rwanda has been indicated as moving at quite a pace, um, but one can probably say they're coming from a very low base. Um, Tanzania, Ethiopia, a few more Rwandas. Rwanda seems to be the one that's popping up the most. We've got Mauritius, Nigeria's come out, Mauritius, mostly, however, Rwanda. Um, someone's also indicated Morocco, first bullet train in Africa being developed. Um, yeah, so it looks like Rwanda mostly. Um, and then Edwin de Klerk said, what is an example of a country with a high pace, but a low base? That's a great question. That's a great question. Edwin. So, so what we try to do is try to just create the framework, right? And so what you, what you could do, um, if you have enough um, kind of opportunity to think about, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, a few years ago, Libya was a very good example. I mean, I think it had about two to three years ago, had a pace of uh, just in GDP terms, for example, of 11 plus percent uh, GDP growth but coming off a base that was absolutely devastated. And so what you could really do if you wanted to be really serious 
uh, about a, a comprehension of Africa is you could take those 54 countries and you can kind of plot them on a very simple graph like this. What we find is that these simple graphs help enormously with higher order decision making. As simple as it may seem, it just presents um, what we call a simultaneous referencing of multiple options. In other words, it, it presents, uh, as any scatter graph would do, um, a view of almost the, the entire continent. And of course, as you can see, I haven't calibrated the axes, but you can think about, about, uh, about the base, even as a high base at various levels of height and pace at various levels of speed. Um, okay, so, so here is just a very simple tool uh, with the Golden Lockton Framework that helps us to think about um, how we can segment our geographical targets uh, in the future of Africa. And what's really interesting, of course, given the current uh, crisis, is whether COVID has eroded the base and retarded the pace for some countries. 